Things, uh, talking about the program, programs, critical skills check off, pit crew, and some things we've updated with pit crew recently, uh, and then operations, operations communications, and I'll get a shame and all that tech. Um, so, so on the on the paramedic program, just a little more progress, meeting a bunch with the university. So, um, in just generally, if you're interested, it's a four semester program. The didactic portion will be starting Tuesday, September 10th. And we'll be ending Wednesday, March 25th. Three nights a week, four hours a night um, at the Missoula College. That's the messy part of it. Uh, that will include some weekends for ACLS PALS, PHTLS. Um, that's the messy part of it. There will be uh, options for you to uh, take your, associate, your associates, so your AAS degree. Uh, there will be separate pre and prerequisites for that, um, which we can talk about, but that's, a, that's not a requirement of getting your national registry. So you can get your national registry, you can get your um, AAS, and they're, they're separate. You have to do both. The costs for the program, which are through the university, $14,900 and something dollars for the full AAS, roughly $9,000 for the medic program. Those are, so if you take the AAS, it includes the medic program, okay? okay? Uh, there is uh, <coughs> Messi, if you work for Messi for two years, and the exact details will we'll get out to you, um, but you'll get about $5,000 of that back if you take it. All their money goes to the university, um, and then Messi will pay you back approximately $5,000. It'll be right in there over the course of two years. So you. You, know, you pay the nine thousand to Mass to the university, and then year one of your employment, twenty five hundred back. Year two, twenty five hundred back. Okay, um, that yeah. Any questions about that? For the AAS, are you those the additional classes just the five prerequisites? Yes. Okay. Pre and or co. You don't have to take them before. Okay. And so those will be things like they'll be in English and cadaver um, uh, you know, AP. Yeah. And, there, and part of my job uh, for this is we'll be just talking with the liaison with the university and figuring out, like, okay, so you've had AP at a higher level, we'll check you off, that sort of stuff. You've had math, you've had writing, whatever it might be. So you might be able to just check off on all of those. The university will still have a fee for that, I'm sure, but you'll have to be. Oh, Some of those details <laughs> says the university. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Kathy uh, Anders is working very hard on this application process, which is uh, for the for the co amps is the very part of it. It's a, it's a bear of a thing to get started. We'll, there will be some some stumbles in it for sure in terms of like just figuring out how how some of this will go. But it is approved. We are moving forward. Um, these are pretty much the dates and. Anybody have any questions? Oh, there is a seven. So AT and T gave seventeen thousand dollars for a scholarship um, to the university for because they're interested in like data and out. They had this like responder support thing going on. We know about that. Um, if you are, I have nothing to do with uh, awarding that, but um, 
uh, talk to Kathy or I about it, and um, I would definitely submit an application at Messi just to get your name in the door for the program. There's no like, there's nothing that you're committing to, but it allows us to just get an idea. And we will ask you when you come to us, like, how serious are you about this? Because we're trying to get a good sense. But filling out an application is not a lot of to take the program. A Seventeen grand. We don't know if that's going to go to like. 17,000 people each get a dollar, or one person gets 17,000 dollars. <laughs> but there is 17,000 dollars. And Kathy and I didn't know if we were going to do that, but we can get two more times. There will be some administrative And there will be an administrative fee, so you will have to pay all of that. Uh, you know, as a student, though, if you take the AAS, one of the advantages is that you are a student at UM, so you have all of the access to the university and the student has, including your financial aid and GI stuff and all that. So if you have any of that, that's a big plus to taking the AAS. We don't make any of that. Just so you're aware, this is a private public partnership. It's it's fairly, uh, it's not unique, but it's fairly unique in this community. And we're just really excited about it. So we're going to have a great program. Um, any questions about that? Some of you have expressed interest in teaching. Uh, particularly the seasoned uh, medics out there and people who have been doing stuff for a while, and I will definitely be looking for that. Particularly, um, you know, we've got some obviously lectures, we'll have a lot of musicians coming in, other folks, and also just helping with skills. There's a lot of skills for this, and I, I will definitely, Kathy and I will definitely be out there looking for um, work from you if, you if you want to do that. All good with that? Okay. Uh, there's a critical skills checkoff that we did three trainings ago. Uh, there are four skills in here, four skills in the main uh, apparatus area. The medics in particular it is required of you by Dr. Kremka that you've been signed off on those. There are a number of people who did not go through that. If you haven't, I haven't tracked you down, <laughs> but uh, you need to come to me and get signed off. It can be, I get times, uh, difficult to maybe tie in. I will sit down with you though. Don't laugh. But I will sit down with you, um, and I'm just going to put out there, and this is a threat slash kind suggestion. If you don't get this done, you will not be able to perform as a paramedic. Michael is going to demote you to a basic level. That, that is going to happen. Okay? We are required to have this. Not a promise. Yeah, it's exactly a promise. It's not a promise. Darn it, I should have taken that. Right. Uh, but anyway, please don't do that. Please come in and get this checked off. Uh, it takes you maybe an hour and a half, two hours per person. Um, it's it's good practice. <laughs> All right, Jeff, did you want to add any emphasis behind that? Okay, pick group. It is also a requirement. It's actually in our contract with the city that we're going to these. I, I need people to come to these trainings, and I know I know that you're on shift and if you're on the calls and stuff. I get it. We did have four this last time. We do it quarterly. I'll put a plug in for it um, in that it's just a great opportunity to, to interact with it, another agency, even if you don't like buy into whatever the numbers that might be generated by, oh yeah, 100% of people are living from thick food. It's not, you know, that, that's a separate issue. It's better than it used to be, I believe that. But the bigger thing is we are here together working as a team. I think Andrea went to, you went to all four or three of them? Or? It's great. It's great. Um, so, uh, if you haven't gone through pick through in this last one, uh, please contact me. I, I need to get you through that. Yeah, and it's not going to be as uh, fun just sitting there with me as it would be with everybody else. So, that's a good punishment. Um, okay, I would like you uh, to, um, if, you, if you took one of these already from pick crew, you do not need it. Otherwise, you share. I'm going to go over this real quick. It's important stuff about our dramatic cardiac arrest. Okay, this is one of the things we went over in pit crew, but everybody should be aware of our traumatic cardiac arrest algorithm. It's approved for both agencies, meaning City Fire and Messy. Give me two minutes to just highlight what's important here. You are welcome to question this, disagree with it, but you need to know it, okay? So here's the whole deal. People who have traumatic cardiac arrest don't survive in any great numbers. In fact, very few of them do, right? This entire algorithm is built around the left column here. 
identifying the people who have a chance of survival from traumatic cardiac arrest. Who are those people? In the chest. Penetrating trauma to the chest, witnessed arrest, like you've been there, or somebody around there, it wasn't like you find somebody in the woods who has a hole in their chest, and you're within 10 minutes of a surgeon. That's basically what it means. Those are the people we need to get to the surgeon quickly. So that's what this, this side of the algorithm here is. Figure out as best you can whether you're dealing with a patient who's been shot or stabbed in the chest recently, right? If you're within 10 minutes, we are, I mean, we, we're not an agency that loves to sit. I know there's been a big change in focus about sitting or staying, but here in particular, we need to be moving. These people do not need us to be doing a bunch of stuff on scene. So you're stopping the hemorrhages, you're doing your march or your ABC algorithm, you are moving these folks out to the ambulance, and then if you're a medic otherwise, then you're doing the stuff that might save their life en route. Now, could you needle the chest as you're rolling the, the guy or lady into the answer? Sure. Yeah. But if you're doing that while they're exsanguinating and you're taking more time to do it, then that's a mistake. So, so the idea is we are moving to the ambulance with these people, and then if nothing else, then when you perform those skills in route. So those skills would be the stuff that, again, could, could make a difference. You're going to manage their airway. You might have to crank them on scene, I guess, for the medics and stuff. You might have to tube them on scene because they need an airway right then. Mm -hmm. But if, if you feel like that doesn't, isn't emergently necessary, you're, you're waiting to get in the back of the ring, oxygenating, bilateral needle, needle, uh, chest needles, and volume resuscitation. Everything else is pretty much like, it's, this is an exaggeration, but not nearly as important because those people, everybody else on this list doesn't survive. <laughs> In fact, these people don't generally survive, as pretty much everybody knows. But this is, this is the chance that we have. And we have these people, right? We definitely see these people. So let's just make sure you understand um, if they're more than 10 minutes away. This is, this is intended to give you an idea like you're in, let's say, up Clearwater, Clinton, and you're trying to figure out, well, what, what should I do? Should I, should I work this person? Should I transport them? So the, the guideline gives you the option of like, let's do this stuff that I otherwise would have done if I were close to the hospital en route. Let's do it here. So we'll needle the chest and do all that sort of stuff. You work that person for 10 to 15 minutes, the algorithm says 15 minutes. Then you can make a decision about whether to transport or not. That doesn't mean you shouldn't transport or you should. It just gives you a guideline of like, those folks, do it right there because you've got all this time anyway transporting them. So you might as well just sit for a little longer, get that stuff done. And when they're dead. And then you're called. And they're dead. And that's the issue is that you got that long. If it's blunt trauma in particular, but penetrating trauma to the chest, or penetrating trauma to the chest, more than 10 minutes away, okay? So then the other thing is that just up here is asystole. I know this can be confusing, but just keep remembering we're really, these are the people who have the chance of survival. Everybody, we work as hard as we can or they need to, but you're trying to just triage as much as possible. If you arrive on scene and they're in a systole, you don't have to terminate efforts. But that is a, that is a case where you're well justified in doing so, statistically speaking. Um, we're at a, we're, you know, this is all pretty close to zero. This is close to zero. So that's what this is made to do: is give you a little bit more guideline about who's moving fast and who you might stay with. Yes. Questions about that? I got one more thing to talk to you about here, and I'm done. So many bastards missed pick through. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right. So this is uh, we're we're at the point now with cardiac arrest, non-traumatic. So so again, just to be clear, I know this comes up sometimes. We're not pick crewing uh, trauma, and we're not pick crewing peas. And what that means is, you, it doesn't mean you don't have an organized system. It means you don't sit for 15 minutes and go through all these rounds and not do any of the other interventions. But, so so that, that needs to be made clear. What this is here is just talking quickly about the fact that there's pretty good evidence that shows that people who get hyperventilated um, post rosp survive poorly. <laughs> and people who get well ventilated so hyperventilation is bad. Low volume resuscitation, you're talking about volume of air. Those people do better statistically. So we are now at the point of like, maybe if we ran, if we ran about 50 maybe survivable arrests in this world last year, that we ran a lot more per year arrests with like people who might think we have a chance. We're now dealing with maybe, maybe we could bump a few, maybe one of these people, right? This is not 
what I'm saying now is, is fine detail. But it's super important to get the idea that we we do trauma to the chest, to the, to the alveoli, and actually decrease survivability when we put a lot of air in there. And we tend to do that when we hold the bag valve mask with both hands and squeeze all 1,200 milliliters. So uh, low volume ventilation is is correlated positively with survivability to hospital discharge. And so um, that six to eight milliliters per, uh, per kg is about what you would get from just squeezing the bag with one hand. And there's actually some systems around the country that use peat mat, bags, and that's not a bad idea. Uh, low volume, way better than what I was trained with, which was like more air is better, right? So, um, so, so that's, these are graphs about that. Now, here's the other thing, fairly fine tuned, but just so you're aware, this is gonna change in our system. This, um, look at this next initial FiO2, so that's the fraction of inspired oxygen, which basically we can't really measure, but we know that at, 100, at uh, 15 to 25 liters per minute, through a bag valve mass, we're gonna get 100% oxygen, um, and that's 100% FiO2. Um, well, 10 minutes post ROSC. Let me, Steven. All right, 10 minutes post ROSC. It's critical that, that, and this is, we should be in the rig by now, right? We start looking at our pulse oximetry, which I would admit I rarely have done. Post, post to red, this is ROSC now, right? But these people who get hyper oxygenated, this is not just high, high volume, but this is too much oxygen, too high concentration of oxygen in the blood, do worse than people who are you oxygenated or oxygenated in the right range. So you all know, right, with blood, hemoglobin, if your SpO2 says 100, that just means 100% of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. But the plasma can be hypersaturated with oxygen. You have no idea how much oxygen is actually in the blood. That elevated level of oxygen is very damaging to tissue, things like brains, hearts, lungs, the things that actually make you survive or not post ROSC. Okay, so once we're at 100% SpO2, we don't know where the blood oxygen level is. But we do know, or at least it's much more, much more predictable, what blood oxygen levels are if SpO2 is between 94 and 99. That's strongly correlated. We can measure that. That usually relates to a PaO2 in a good range, like 8200. Okay, does that make sense? People are hyperoxygenated, do worse. People are hyperventilated, do worse. So how do we not hyperoxygenate them? We watch their SATs, and we're going to do something that is a little bit different, which is turn their oxygen down. Turning their oxygen down decreases FiO2, and what you're shooting for here, this is this would be in route, is a, is a pulse ox somewhere between 94 and 99 percent. That's fairly fine-tuned stuff at that point. If you have your head on straight, then you're thinking that way. But if you got a lot of stuff going on, I fully realize like might not occur to you, but it should add. We should add this to our checklist. If I say let's check this, and if you let's say you have somebody in Sealy and you got a long transport, this again we're dealing with maybe we bump another person over. That person plus person who's getting proper volume versus the opposite, well, these are the people that we can maybe push over into the, the survivability side, okay? So the other thing is that our, our bags have peak valves on them and they, um, the peak valves are set at five. And so the other thing that you can do and should do is turn your peak up. Now what your peak does in particular, if you put up really high, you can drop down your FiO2, but what you're really looking for here with peak, which is positive and expiratory pressure, is to keep the alveoli open. And by keeping the alveoli open, that's called recruitment, that you don't have this mismatch of blood coming up to the lungs and not picking up oxygen. That mismatch is really, really bad for your body. It does not do well in the <coughs> ROSC setting. So your goal here is to keep your PEEP on, to keep the alveoli open, and then turn your oxygen down to where they're just picking up enough oxygen, but they're staying open and they're picking up oxygen and dropping off CO2. So you're keeping that atelectasis, which is the blood, the LDI from collapsing, you're keeping that from happening, and you're keeping your body as well oxygenated as it needs to be, but not over oxygenated. So low volume, low, low FiO2, shoot for your SpO2s in the 94 to 99 range. Okay, big thing here uh, for us in the field, please remember if you have post-ROSC, you're looking at your end tidal CO2, which you should be looking at, right? If that end tidal starts going down, the most likely thing is that that patient is going, is failing, their heart is failing. They're about to go into cardiac arrest. The mistake that Mike Kremka, our medical director, wants to make sure he hears, we've all heard this at Pick Group, we went, but I'll say it again. The mistake we don't want to make 
is looking at that number, let's say it was 35 and now it's 22, and say, oh, I need more carbon dioxide in this body, so I'm gonna stop ventilating this person, <laughs> right? To build up their carbon dioxide. Probably what you should be thinking is, they're about to go and get into cardiac, go into cardiac arrest here. Is there anything else I can do, like leave with that or other stuff? Is there anything else I haven't been doing to support them? Am I oxygenating them well? So that's a big, big take home point. Please don't sit there and be like, oh, I just was ventilating them to a minute because they need more. That has been done. It's never done successfully. <laughs> People don't do well when we have that. So that's what we went over in picture this month. Questions? Thanks. Oh, good. I think Don and I are going to kind of tag team this thing a little bit. But we want to talk radios tonight just so everybody feels comfortable for the basic operation of the radios. Who's already got a radio in here? Probably everybody in blue. So, um, do like, uh, uh, So, I think the uh, lecture part of this, we're trying to get Dom off to another meeting here, so I think what we'll do is just go over the operation of the uh, portables real quick, and then um, this other stuff, Dom, we can hit on okay. after we do that, but um, you guys know we have the portable motor rolls and we also have the mobile units. Uh, mobile units are a lot easier to operate, I think, really. We will be trying to get with everybody just one-on-one -on -one to work on the mobile units to sit inside the ambulance and kind of go through it. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask, and I think it's about time we kind of start helping you figure those things out so that you know what to do when it's, especially when it really gets crazy, that's when we start to kind of break down a little bit. But um, then we have our portable units. Does everybody have a portable unit when they're working? Yes, obviously. What's what's the good thing about having a radio when you're working? Really cool. There. Yeah. You get separated from the partner and someone tries to kill you, you yes. call the PD. Yeah, so think of it that way. It's also your lifeline, and it is your lifeline if you get if something goes bad and you know it seems like in Missoula that's that potential is happening more and more. So I think it's really important that you, uh, that every crew member has a radio. And I, you know, I know a lot of times they get left in the rigs. I think you should try to get in the habit of wearing the radio and just have it on. I know at night it's a pain and um, whatever works best for you, we'll try to make happen, whether it's the clip or the uh, belt. Does anybody want the microphones? We have some of those microphones that attach to them. It's, it seems like, like for myself, I've never found that to be very helpful. You're just for events that are loud. Yeah, yeah. And, and even that, it's like it doesn't really do the do justice. But um, okay, so this there's two different models of the XTS 2500 Motorola. There's the one that has the uh, digital keypad and everything on it, and then there's the one that doesn't. How many people in here have ones that have the digital keypad on it? They count. There's something like half of the links between the two. That's kind of funny. It doesn't have the keypad. So yeah, I would say that's digital. Heidi, you got one. I'm just trying to get a feel for how many we actually have, how many digitals we have. So, all right. So. Don, why don't you go over this one first? This is an older model. These actually are pretty good radios. You know, the uh, fire departments got rid of these and went to the Kings. And the King radio is one that if you're going to do wildland firefighting, you almost have to have a King radio because it's programmable out on the fires. And um, their old model was about that big, um, but it was a really nice radio. And recently they went to a smaller radio. And, you know, I thought it was going to be like the cats, you know what, and 
it seems like it's got some issues. And, and like when we're doing the AAIR training, these radios are actually better than theirs. I heard those radios just chew through batteries. They chew through batteries. They can't, you know, like even if you get rid of your uh, repeater mode and put it in direct, they can hardly talk to each other from one end of the hall. They think there's just some kind of small problem that has to get worked out. And I, I was going to get a King and start practicing with it and see if maybe we should move to the King radio. But that really has been kind of a, a little wait. So this is what we got. We may try to get some more of these so that we always have them for events and everything else. But um, anyways, Don, why don't you go open that one? OK, so I know these ones fairly well. So obviously, the rotary dial up on top, if you guys want to spin that, you see your channel number. But if you'll notice right before it, it says A. That's the A bank. If you do the rotary switch, that's where the channel was right underneath it on the back side. Move to B. It should say B on the front. It'll say B on your radio as well. Are you with me on that? And then there's C bank. There's also um, D, E, and F. And the way to get the D, E, and F is you go back to channel A. And on the side of your radio, the very bottom push button, if you push that, <coughs> the next one up, not the bottom one. The next one up from the bottom, that should put you into the D bank if you're on A. If you go to B and C, it's going to be faster because we don't have those programmed. Like if you do the slide. Bar, <coughs> I my brightness. Is that only on the old ones? Because this one doesn't change. It just, it just doesn't change. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering. Uh, well, where's your, where's your top <laughs> slide bar at? Is it on A? Yeah, it's on A. Okay. And then you hit D. Yeah. Are you hit the second bottom up? Yeah. Yeah, I hit B. Which one? I just B. This is the old one. So we're doing zones. You do zones that differently. Bob knows how to do the whole thing. Oh, perfect. Oh, is that a digital? Yeah. 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 Well, they're all, it's the one that has the keypad or the little scroll mouse on the front. Yeah. So the radio I'm going over is the one that does not have. These are the two different radios. Digital and, and regular. We almost do it. And you can go over that real quickly in a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The very bottom button, if you watch your screen when you push it, you'll see it kind of towards the left of the screen, a little two lines come up and a little dash in the middle of it. That's for repeater mode and non repeater mode. So, that's very important. yeah. Say that again, sir. So, that's repeater mode. Which one? I so, guess the button. Yeah. Let me just come back and show you guys real quick. The very bottom button on these old radios, push the bottom button. <laughs> so when that is on your display, and your, what's that? No. So when that shows up in your screen, that means you're indirect. You're not using a repeater. Uh, one disclaimer I found out when Bob was actually doing his due diligence and went through our new repeater channel. I didn't in the programming software. You have to check a little box in there that says talk around, which is the repeater. I didn't check though, so I got to go through and reprogram, reprogram all the radios, put that little box in there. So the repeater mode will work on our private channel, but the 911 channels, one through five, are all repeated. So if you have that on your screen, you're not going, 911 not going to hear you. So you have to pull it off. And I can show you, like right now, it's on. You don't hear the repeater kick in. If I go into repeater mode, you should hear the repeater. And we'll talk about the repeater in direct. Um, the orange button on top, and that's the same function program in all radios, including the mobiles, is the encryption uh, button. Not all the channels have encryption. Uh, the law enforcement channels and the EMS channels, which is our hospital channel. So a little history on that, why we have it, we don't use it. Um, when St. Pat's and community went to medical records, for some reason, they really wanted the patient's name because they can't create a chart. Mike probably explain better than I can, but they can't do anything ahead of time until we get there. So they have a patient to get stuff going in Epic, so they can start ordering whatever they order, X-rays, stuff like that. <laughs> so we went with encryption, um, and HIPAA rules: as long as you're encrypted, you can use the patient's name over the radio. You can, you know, 34-year-old male patient, give them Dave McAvoy, whatever. Um, we have not done that. 
they asked us to, we got already, and they haven't asked us since. So the orange button, we may program with something else in the future, but just for your own information, the orange button is for encryption. On these radios, that's the uh, um, squelch. Is it? Yeah. So, so it's not on, just download that more plain version, it's, it, it's the uh, encrypted on this one, it's just your squelch to see where you're. <laughs> And then this can get kind of confusing, but scan list is pretty easy to do, but I always got to fumble my way through it. And I think it's the same even on those radios. The very top button on this one is purple. Like I told you, if you push it on scan, you see the little Z there, the little Z's gone. Just put it back where you see the Z is there. And then just push and hold it for about three seconds. And now you see a little box flashing. Have you seen that? So now you can just scroll through your channels. And as you as, as the Z is right above the number, if a channel is not in a scan list like MRFD TAC one, you won't see that little Z. So whatever, as long as that box is flashing, whatever is showing up for the Z is what's in your scan list. And that's important to know because you can get on a scene and make somebody program oh, yeah. and show more. Uh, then you get off and just key your mind. You don't hear anything. If you want to get out of programming the scene. Um, so Don, to, are you going to go this way to add or remove anything like that? Yeah, so to add or remove, there's three different tiers of the um, scan. If you push it the first time, you'll see the Z come in there. If you can push it, you'll give it a little dot behind the Z. And then third is a flashing dot. We just go to where you first get the first Z. The other ones just give it priority. And that makes them all priority. If that makes any sense. So, so you're all done programming. You got the channels taken out you wanted out. It's the same procedure. You just feed your mic, and it'll take you out of programming mode. Or shut your radio off and turn it back on. And that also harms it, right? Like if they were um, in a different bank and they wanted to get back to their main bank, there's no way to do that on that one, right? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> This one old, does have that ability. The old one you can't. You can scan things, but you have to actually physically switch. Talk. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So you can scan, you can put any channel in zones A through D in these, like if you want to scan red. The D channel is all of the color channels, just so you know. Yeah. Just a reminder, we did make up those um, laminated things that should be on the ambulances that have all the channels on them, mobiles and portables. Um, if you want to scan red, you just zone it. Make sure you go to programming first. Go into um, scan programming and just go to channel D, find the red channel, and you put it in your scan list. It will scan over multiple zones. It just won't transmit. You have to actually go to the channel. If you want to go to red, if you're on the A band, you're going to have to go to red. So you'll hear what's going on on the red channel if you're on the main bank A that we use every day, and you're scanning the red channel. You'll hear what they're saying on the red channel, but they may call you, and for a second you'll see that red channel on your radio, and you may think that you know you can key the mic and talk to them, but you cannot do that. You have to go back to that bank to talk on that channel. That's where it gets that's where it gets confusing. That's where like VCs and ICs will have you know a main radio, another one here, maybe another one here. Sometimes it just gets to be too crazy trying to go back and forth in those banks. And some radios now you can. You can go to the bank as soon as it keys up. You just key the mic twice or something like that, and it connects to a button on the radio, and then you can talk on that one. But these ones don't have that. And I don't even think the Kings that the city police and fire have has it either. The nice thing about the mobiles, we can program as many channels in the bank as we want. These are restricted to there's only 16 channels in the bank, so that's why there's so many distinct zones. Um, and one thing I wanted to just reiterate before I leave on our especially on the mobile radios, the Idaho channel. So when you're going to Idaho, and that happens a lot in the summertime, once you get the top of the pass, switch over to the Idaho channel. No, I should have tested it coming down, but anyway, go over to Idaho channel and just call Idaho dispatch. It's actually Grangeville who you will talk to, and they'll answer you right away. They'll give you an update whether you can cancel what, what you have, but don't go down into Idaho blind. The reason we did that is we had a cruise quite a few years ago, walked into Jerry Johnson in the middle of a shooting and had a pack patient out. 
with no law enforcement. And the high risk trauma that's always up there is on that channel as well. That's their main channel they talk on. So for your guys' safety, once you hit the top of the pass, make sure you switch over. It's, it's on the very upper end, so go from like fire one, two, three, and then keep going down. It's probably three or four on the upper level. It's called Idaho Dispatch. It's also, I believe, repeated, so you can talk to them all the way down into Grangeville if you want to. Does that same channel work for Val? What's what? Does that same channel work for Val and Idaho? Howell County? Yeah, is that Highway 12? <laughs> Not Howell County. Howell. Right? Howell. Yeah, I don't know if Howell's still in there. It should. I changed everything and called it Idaho Dispatch, so it wouldn't be confusing. But I got one. Idaho Dispatch work for. That's a multiple reporter, right? It's yeah, the same radio. Same people. Just different name on the radio. Yeah. Idaho yeah. Dispatch instead of Powell County. I did not change it in these. Jim just pointed out in the portables it still has Powell, but that's actually the same channel. I, didn't, I just changed the name in the radio so you knew it was Idaho Dispatch. Not to confuse it with Powell County in Montana. Because it's Powell Ranger Station. In the portables. That's right, yeah. Exact same channel. And maybe when we fix all the talk around, I'll fix that in the American list and update the sheets and the ambulances. I think that was the most important thing I wanted to get across. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Sorry. I got another one. All right. Cool, John. Get out of here. Um, do you guys want to take five minutes to get something to drink or something? I know we didn't provide refreshments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, take five minutes. I'm like, you're all the guys that are just like, oh my god, you should hear it. All right, so instead of me uh, going out with uh, fire <laughs> instead of me going with this radio right now and following up, I think it's better if Jeff gets his uh, portion of this in since he's on shift right now and uh, we'll probably get tapped out here at some point. So Jeff's going to talk about okay. HR stuff. All right. and so, and yeah, so we're using the lab tech and some members turn stuff. Uh, some stuff comes from me and the rest of the management team, and some of it comes from Schnee. Um So just so you know. Some of them's bare, bad news kind of thing. So, um, narc logs, we're doing a pretty good job. We're about 95%. We need to be at 100. Um, you need to be compliant with what our um, policy says about controlled substance handling. So, this is more for the medics, but basics we want you to help your paramedics be accountable. Um, but um, one of the things that are coming up that's a problem for from myself and for Don to track, and we track all the narcotics is putting in the numbers properly, meaning the numbers that you put in to pull out of the machine need to match what you put in from a lab tech. So your call number that you put in from a lab tech should match the machine. So your numbers should be 2019, in this case 2019, and whatever digits behind that, pulling that out of the machine, that also should be your number that you pull out of a lab tech. Because I have to be able to check and balance those and, and find them. What people tend to do is just put the last four numbers on there out of the machine or in the thing. And what the problem with that is if two years from now that or next year that number is going to repeat itself. So from a litigation standpoint, if we ever got called into court three years later, we can't correspond those numbers with a chart necessarily because they don't because they will repeat themselves. That's why we use the year. So please be more cognizant of that. Um, outdates, um, again, something else is in this. This is very few times, I'm just bringing it up, very few times you guys miss this. But outdates need to have a usage form attached to it. So that, so if you outdate Lorazepam, which is the most common thing we use, you need to put out a usage form that says you use it, basically you wasted it, and you replace it just so that we have checks and balances that way. So we're held accountable from the um, Drug Enforcement Agency. So they can pull this stuff Anytime they want. If we're not compliant, we can get fined. 
and the outdation you should just use that day to day. That's correct. And the thing that when you pull it out of the machine, what we ask you to do is use the date and then whatever ambulance is attached to. So like so today would be what? 06, 15, or 14, whatever day it is. 12. 12, 12 19, and then 531 if that's the ambulance took it out of. Just so that we can correlate where those where that comes from. That's that's your, I haven't been using huh? That's for outdates. That is for outdates only. Maybe we or any them. medication that I mean it doesn't have to be narcotics, but any medication, because obviously we date just other things other than narcotics. But we should we should put that in so we can attach it to those um, ambulances. I was just gonna say maybe we should put like a little booklet or you know, well, it's actually on the machine now. It tells me exactly on the, how you want those. We can do that. I mean, I can, I, I can, I can print, I can print the. I mean, I have it on on a paper form, and I'm going to put this out on a light tech just on the form screen. When you log in next time, you'll be able to see it, and I'll put it in storage. So yeah, I'll put this in storage, good. but I'll yeah. put that that piece in storage so you can refer to it if you want to. Jeff, how are we doing? We're witnessing and wasting events. So your partner, whoever your partner is on shift, is the person that should be wasting it. So here's where the problem is le legally, you guys. If you don't do your, if you go home and I call you and say, hey, you got a narcotic missing, and you fill out the narcotic form, which I'm thankful that you do, your partner's really not signing for that. So there is some things that are left in a gray area that can be scrutinized. So. I have, Go ahead. How about the actual way that you want it? Like, I assume not just the vial in the charge container with ketamine. Uh, we have a specific. We don't obvious. have a specific. I mean, that's what we've always done. We've drawn it off, wasted it in a sink or in on the bay floor at St. Pat's, which is commonly with somebody's tongue sticking out. But, <laughs> but, we, but we don't want these controlled substances in the bottles. No, the they need to be drawn out of the vial. That's what you, is that what you're asking? That's what you're trying to get. Yeah, they need to be drawn out of the vial. So if you want, because you like in the 500 milligram ketamine, we may only use, or the 200 may only use a little bit of it, especially when we have the 500 now, since we're getting away from 200. So you're only going to use a very small amount of that, you know, for not even a cc in most cases for pain management. And so you're going to have the other four and a half cc's at least to draw off. So yes, yeah, good point. We should be drawing those meds off. Somebody needs to be witness you drawing those meds out and, dis and dispose of them. Okay, that makes sense. Can people even actually make sure if you're the witness that you witness it? Yeah, your partners. And that's why I said the basics need to try to help you keep your paramedics accountable. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't. There, there's no. There, there's nobody in this room thinks anybody is doing anything other than the meds, other than wasting them. The, that's not the point. The point is we need to handle them properly. Okay. So, um, what else? Uh, outdates. Da, da, da. Um, so, question. Uh, yeah. Question. So, can uh, um, a ALS provider only get out ALS drugs like atropine and all that? Yeah, so if you're an EMT with endorsements let's, or an advanced EMT, you can get whatever drugs are attached to your license out. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So, I mean, they can co-sign for you with for controlled substance. No, I mean like atropine, like my no. partner. No. So they can't If it's not in their scope of practice, they can't pull it. Oh. At least that's supposed to be the design if they can, and Donnie's got something in the settings wrong. But no, only it has to be within your scope. All right. Okay. Um, so, Jeff, can I ask one more thing? Yes. We don't want charge around Is that right? That is correct. So, we haven't quite figured out what we're going to do there. They can't really even come over to education legally because we're supposed to track the lot number from the time it leaves the pharmacy to the time it arrives into our machine to the time it gets in the truck. We're, legally, we're supposed to do that legally. Um, we have not done a good job of that in history, but we're supposed to. So, um, I don't know, I'll come up with something that we'll, we'll come up with a plan on how we dispose of those drugs. Probably just needs to be all needs to be drawn out in a, in a mass and, and wasted. And we can refill them with water and use them for training if we want to. But. I've been bringing those over. We have been for years. Yeah. No, we shouldn't be doing that.
No. Um, this other part wasn't really about yeah, medications, and I, and I did ask you. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. What about the well, dying drugs that are expired? That's what we're talking about. So we, we need to do a better job of disposing of them. So those, those really need to be drawn out and disposed of. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the drug is. So D50. Doesn't matter what the drug is. It doesn't matter. It needs to be disposed, including LR and normal safe. Do all waste sheets on this? No, they are not required. Okay. I mean, we, we may figure that out. We may figure that out. And we may figure that out for checks and balances to say we're ordering too much of these meds and we only need to carry X amount because we never use them. That may be. But I don't know if we'll get that far into that. Can we donate them to a third world country? No, we used to be able to donate them to uh, like farm or to uh, like vets and stuff, and we can't do that anymore. And unfortunately, when they expire, we all know it lasts. Long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly. Um, I put this in there to let this really is kind of a place, but incidents, and the only reason I brought this is because we had an incident the other day. So, incidents that may happen, I want you using that incident reporting thing. So, we had a provider that got spit on by a, a patient the other day, um, which is a workman's comp claim, but we need the incident so we can attach that to the paperwork just so that we can track it, so we make sure that you guys get taken care of medically, financially, all those things, that, so you don't get that. And we just want an instant report, especially if it's something else that maybe becomes chronic or something like that. Is that in the lab tech? It is, okay. yep. There's an incident, incident reform uh, under, under the forms there for incident, any type of incident. It could be anything, whether it's a crash, um, whether it's you know a patient um, assaults you, whether whatever it is. Um, so and most of it's just free texting in there, so you can just free text and do whatever you want. What is medical crew risk? That's what I'm talking about. If there's a medical crew risk, like if somebody got um, an accidental needle stick or got, um, you know, assaulted. assaulted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I put this up there, and again, I'll I'll post this again. Um, I have some copies here on my handout. Please share. I already made 10 copies. I'm not sure how many. And this really, again, this pertains to the medics mostly. You guys can share some copies. And this is just a reminder of the policy. I know you guys know the policy, but um, some of the things that we're going to crack, have to crack down on is because of the Drug Enforcement Agency that has potential for to um, get in the middle of our move, if you will. Um, so, unfortunately, because I track this stuff, that means you're, if you're not compliant, you're probably going to hear from me. Um, I don't want to, again, I'm kind of like Dave, I don't want to say threatening kind of stuff, but um, you, need to, you need to do your job, and that means you need to do it in a timely manner. And I'm going to let some of that slide initially, but if, if I see there's a pattern, then we're going to have to take the measures to stop it. So this is the portion, this is the first portion of it basically talks about how you get on shift and do your thing and um, replacing medications, using the lab tech, um, doing your daily checks as soon as you can. You're responsible for your four ambulances that you're on um, and like to see that we do all five and that should be some of our responsibilities as managers to help you guys with that. So I'm asking you to do that. We want you to do those without having to go through any type of verbal warning or those types of things. And this, this carries on into the usage. So this talks about, and this is stuff that I'll put on the live tech for reminders on how you document those in the live tech as far as here's a call number, here's a transfer number, here's an event number, yeah. whatever it is that you use, those are things that I'll, I'll bring forward to you guys so that you can review them if you need to. I'll put them in the live tech under the storage piece so that you guys can look at it. Okay? Um, again, outdated medicines, I, that's a duplication, but make sure you. Yeah. If I uh, use a Narcon transfer, they go to replace it. There's no T's or R's on that keypad. Say again. Good question, Jim. Mm -hmm. When I go to replace a Narc, I use on a transfer. Okay. There's no T's or R's on or EVs for the event number on that keypad to get to the drugs. There's no T R. So I've just been using the date, you know, dropping the T R or the EV, and just using okay. the date because it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so maybe, um, and this was more, I guess, more from, that's probably more from uh, a charting component, but you're right, we probably should, uh, maybe we should come up with a numbering system to say, we put a, a series of numbers before that, and I'll see if I can come up with that. 
So we'll say that like, like, like transfer, like transfers would be whatever five plus that days or whatever, whatever we do, we can do something. And what you're doing sounds like that's working this fine. So that's fine. Yeah, you can put your you can put your time in first and then attach that to your ambulance even whatever doesn't matter. Um, and I see that, and I see it on the transfer. So I don't, I don't ever question those when I see them. But yeah, we should probably be more uniform there. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. I've had several um, medics ask you when they're coming on for the night shift. They should be checking on their. Um, yes, that is a requirement. We should be checking our reason and shift change. Is that in there? No. Okay. So I need to add that in there. Yeah, we should be, in, we need to, like, I need to go in and check my nurse when I get to my ambulance. I know, I know Patty comes on at night and she does her, and I, I, know, I know most of everybody does. But we should, yeah, I should all put that in there. Thank you. Yeah. We should absolutely, we should be responsible at shift change, whether it's at 600, 06 or 1800. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Trades and giveaway. I am asking you, and I'm very lenient, and our old trade policy said you had to have 48 hours of lead time for trade, and I, I've done away with that because a lie tech makes life easy for us. What I'm asking for, if it's under 24 hours, is you either contact me or contact whoever the manager on duty so that we're aware of it, that it's out there. Um, and you know, we're, we will help you, and some of this information is, you are responsible for your shift. If you put it out there, light takes only a tool. So you're still responsible for your checks, which means you may need to get on the phone and call some people that you know. What I can do for you, Bob, or whoever's on shift can do for you, is we can go into a light tech and say, here's the people that showed availability at the time that I wrote the schedule. Here's the people that still may be available. Here's the map, call them. And then they may be able to bail you out. Maybe they're just not paying attention to the trades. Maybe however they have their settings set on their phone or, or their email or whatever. They may they may have that, but certainly do that. Um, you may have to call folks. Um, the other thing, and this is probably more from the basics than it is the paramedics, except for maybe John Gardner. Please don't stretch yourself too thin when you get into these 36 and 48 hour shifts. I didn't put the exception in there except for John Gardner because he does tend to, and you know, and I don't care the Medic 5 thing, but Medic 5 is getting their butt kicked. Yeah. I mean, the last six months. So that's not even that's not even a good thing to say that's easy to get away with because Medic 5 goes tends to work harder sometimes than the frontline ambulances does at days. I mean, at least time in the truck anyway. It may not work harder physically, but certainly more time in the truck. So just be careful of that. Um, and yeah, so some of the questions that come up to me is how do I accept trades? So here's how I do. Here's how I do it. So just so you know, it is strictly by the numbers. Meaning if Brad puts out a trade and and Bob signs up for it. If he's the only one that signs up for it, and even if he's on overtime, I'm gonna give it a little bit of time unless it's the next day, unless there's a time restraint. Then Bob would get it. But if multiple people sign up for it, I strictly go in there and I look at the numbers. And if, and if you got 16 hours and you got 24, he's gonna get it, he's got less hours. Strictly by the numbers, okay? Unless somebody specifically asks somebody else to take that shift. Um, I know for you, and I pick on Brad a little bit because Brad got a shift in I2 in only because Stacy had already talked to John about covering that day portion of the shift last week. So there was multiple people, but I already knew that prearrangement. And you didn't put it out just for John, you put it out for everybody to see, which now I'm not picking on Stacy, I'm not picking on Stacy at all. I'm just saying that's how that happened and that's how he got denied a shift. And but again, I'm just looking at the numbers. That's how I look at it, strictly. So whoever's got the least amount of hours gets the shift. Um, so it has nothing to do with anything else. If we make an arrangement with someone, they're willing to. If you want it to, I do. If you see, if I, so that's why I chose John in this incident, like I'm talking about, because I knew that, and she, he said, "This is for." She's put in there. This is for John. But see, when she sends that, she can actually specifically. She say can only to him. Yeah, she can. If you want, she to didn't. Do she didn't do that. But <laughs> <laughs> do you want us to do that? I do. Yeah. If you're specifically doing it, don't leave the others out of it. So then it doesn't become in question. That's what I would ask. And then there's no, you know, there's no heartburn over it. I cast 
a broad net. John was the first one. Fish to on. Yeah, yeah. He was the first one in there. Yeah, yeah. Fish on. Yeah. And wait for him. Yeah. Okay. So then that's how that um, happened. Sign ups in advance. So full time people, um, I, I'm, I'm working pretty close with, with um, Stephen on this. Um, Stephen's gonna Stephen's gonna manage the, the events for the most part, um, and what I've asked him to do is not allow the full time people to sign up for events until the, until we get enough leeway again. If it's something this close where he gets an event tomorrow, then it's a free for all. But I'm asking him to allow the, allow the basic part time people and, and and even medic full time or part time people to have a chance to pick up those extra hours. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm asking him to do. <coughs> it's not perfect. He's doing a good job with it. Uh, it's not perfect, and we're going to make mistakes. Just, but that's what I'm asking. That's what I'd like to do. Same thing with open ships. I'm going to give it to the part-time people first before I give it to the full-time people. Okay. Okay. Image trim. Okay. So I'm being forced a little bit because we had, um, I had several phone calls from St. Pass and community on reports that were out from patients that were sick that we brought in that weren't done in their 24 hour period. And we are held accountable by the state. We're mandated to have those done in 24 hours of transport. So that being said, I did this once before and it really did seem to curve that. I don't wanna go back to calling you guys and saying, hey, you got reports out. I don't wanna do that because that, it's annoying to you, it's annoying to me. Um, but if you do, you got transports out there, and especially if you got controlled substance attached to those reports, you're going to get a phone call from me because I'm going to look at that daily um, and see what reports are out there. And whatever's left, then you're going to get a phone call from it. Um, the other part of that is those paperwork that go in your box. Um, there's a lot of paperwork in some of you guys' box. And some of the paperwork like I put in today, there's still paperwork that I put in there last week. So that means you're not looking at your paperwork. Please look at your paperwork and do those reports. If they don't, some of them have multiple names on them, so they may not even belong to you. And I think most of that paperwork that we put in there, Shanae has also sent them a notice at yeah, some point that she's looking for that. So yep, yep. try to address those as quick as you can. Yep. Yeah, so please, just please, just please do your report. And those cancels, the ones I know that are, are really eat on you guys at three in the morning and you're driving back from a cancel, no contact. I mean, you really you can have that done before you get back to the shop. And then it's, you don't have to print it, you don't have to scan anything. You know, just get those kind of things done. Get that stuff off your, uh, off your shoulders. Um, your inbox in uh, Imistrin. I'm asking you to go to your inbox every day or go on the online thing to see if you have anything in your inbox. Two reasons. One, Sinead may be sending you something, and Dave may be sending you something. And you need to respond to those. North? Thank God. Um, Dave, is, if Dave has a, 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 a charting question about a report that's in question, he's going to send you something in your box. Please be responsible and respond to him. You know, you say, got it, I'll talk to you about it next time. It doesn't have to be a long explanation. Just respond. It. Same thing with Shania. But just sign a report, go in there and sign it, and just say done and send it back to her so she knows she doesn't have to follow up anymore. Please. This is from Shania. So I just copied and pasted this. So this is, I'm going to have to read this because I didn't really read it. I just copied and pasted it. So every report must have a negative a narrative. Apparently, somebody out there is putting see other patient care report. I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't even know what scenario that means. I guess, I guess. That's the only scenario I can think of. That means see virus report if you didn't do anything. That's what I'm guessing. Yeah, so there still has to be a narrative in our, yeah, that may be true. So that still has to be a narrative in our report. Um, so she says she's getting complaints from you guys about putting things ready for billing when you're not done with it. So she's gonna leave it alone until she sees it says crew complete. So that you can get that accomplished. Therefore, she's not going to then she'll process that as she needs to. Okay. Um, attachments. Hopefully, with these new MDTs, we won't have to worry about the attachment things. The scanning thing will probably go obsolete once we get to all four of those online, because you can take pictures with those new 
um, laptops. If, if you're using that. If you're using that MDT. If you're using your own scanner, which we advise you not to do that because there's a HIPAA component that when I'm, I'm get, I drove into a whole bunch of stuff from um, our, our Univision company did a big HIPAA compliance. So there's some things that we're gonna have to change, like your password. You're gonna have to be changing your passwords on a quarterly basis. We're gonna have to have an eight, eight, yeah, we're gonna have to have an eight digit lockout thing. Our computers are gonna have to lock out every five minutes. Meaning you don't if you're not in your ambulance and you want to get in there to run a call, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to log into it. So I know. Sorry. <laughs> We might figure this out. There's the chances of us being able to get CAD bags on, like at least the computers at the office. Okay, we don't know that story yet. They're they're doing their investigation. So here's what I know: somebody got in trouble. Somebody did something they should have done. County's investigating until that investigation is done, and they slapped whoever's hand is. We're not even going to see it. We don't even have it. It's not. It's and it's not us turning it off. Is. It's nine one one. We need it back too. We yes. need it especially on like on yeah. calls. I, I need to have this. Yeah. I didn't know if this was like. It's crippling. Uh, yeah. It really it's is crippling for us. Oh, I know. Do you like it? So it's your MDT should yeah. have them. We don't have it in the kitchen anymore. The yeah. one downstairs doesn't yeah. have it. So it's on. It's on licensed products in this building. So like the MDTs are the only things that are right. going to have it, and yeah. that it is yeah. a problem. Just seeing who's on calls at two o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Yeah, I know, man. Yeah. Trust me. That's the only way I knew to call you to my house when my wife had her name. Right. Because I saw you just clear the same path. Right. I mean, I, I know it's crippling. They, I, we, so we we're hoping like, that it'll get it fixed, but I don't know that we'll ever see it yeah. from a personal level again. Yeah, I, I think maybe the day of having it on the phones and they got to come up with something to get this into our business. We had we got to get this figured out. Yeah, agreed. Um, um, so I have a kind of backup yeah. question. Yeah. Um, so yeah. as far as getting the reports done within 24 hours, does that mean they need to be completed all the way as far as scanning everything? Needs to be yeah, scanned. so they have to be at the hospital for 24 hours. But like, as far as like, because like sometimes if you have like a bunch of calls at night, then you go home and write them in the morning, and you write everything out. Like, so you have 24 hours from sleep. the time you drop the patient yeah. off at the hospital. If you drop the patient off at two yeah. minutes to six, you have until two minutes to six the next day to get it done. But it has to be like all the paperwork has to be uploaded. Because that's the thing. The report like, has to be uploaded. So yeah, in, in a sense, yeah, you got to have your stuff scanned. Okay. What's the time lag? We we say it's complete. Does it go to the hospital right then? As soon as we lock it. Okay. Well, that's what, See, we that's don't lock it anymore. As soon as you okay, post so it. you need to finish the report. Yeah, but that's different than locking. So if you if you're Shenanigans. offline and you post it, if you're offline and you post it, you still have to get on. It still has to get finished. Because all that does is post it to the online side. That's the problem with doing the, the offline version. Mm -hmm. If you're online, down there where the thing is where you say you're going to hit attachments and attach attachments, that's where you finish it or lock your report. Once it's locked, then the, the paperwork goes to the hospital. We need to be doing that. But the problem Every is time. locking yeah, it at that point okay. in time. I've been working with Grant a while. Grant's not going to write his report at 3 o'clock in the morning. He's going to write it tomorrow. I can't sign it yeah. until he writes it. If he locks it, I can't sign it. Yeah. Well, Grant. <laughs> Just keep the same thing. I mean, Grant. He can't sign it. I understand that. And yeah, we know you guys work hard. Look, we, 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 we know. We, we know. Look, I. There's, there's going to be latitude. We just got to give me some latitude. Yeah. I don't want to say I'm going to be just sitting back and saying. I, I, I was just wondering what the. The things that bother me that are, are really. The things that are going to be really bad are the bad traumas, the things we have control substance to it. Some of those, some of those other things like Bill Bish at 3 in the morning, I'm probably going to. Well, he's going to get it. He's here tomorrow. You know, I, and I hate to say I'm not going to be fair about it, but I'm just going to say that some of the things that are crucial, they're gonna, we're going to get hammered for them. No, I just didn't want to precipitate it. Yeah, because the doctor called the other day for a report, and I'm like, oh, I don't know. So I had to make a phone call to get a report. Yeah. They have to download it at the hospital. It doesn't automatically print out. It no, doesn't what? print, but it does, it does go to their server or wherever it goes. Yeah, the Hubcast is going to yeah. get it. It has to so, go But it only does it after we lock. That's correct. Well, they're, they're not going down. Jeff, just quick because back. the hockey comes in the next day. Yeah. When you hit post, 
it, then it locks it and it says this is locked. So it, it does. Yeah. Okay, good. I don't ever use that version. I, know, no so I thought you had I thought once you post it you could still go online and look at it and change yeah. it. Well it says hit, this is locked. Yeah, you can hit no to lock and it will Okay, well I don't Okay, know. then you okay, then you lock. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Just a, that's fine. Okay, let me let me finish this and then we'll go to questions. Because okay, I'm gonna get tapped here in a minute because now everybody's gone. Um, so this is some other again some other stuff. Um, look at your attachments, make sure they're there. Uh, make sure you're getting your signatures to sign it. Um, make sure your face sheets and it looks like the billing office wants the fire report attached to it. Do you want to get one? Well, then you can't attach it to anything you don't have. Right. But if there's nothing written on it. I you still want to attach it? No, 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 Attach it. Do they require two if you have contact and then the refusals do, right? Yeah, yes. If you have contact with a patient, that requires, that should require both signatures. Wait, I just, I'm not sure what Robert said, but if you really want the fire sheet attached, it's a big part of what Mike wants for us to do is follow this call through and what Fire Game will be. Even if they've just got the one, I was talking about it. Yeah, final mission, it shows that it was a fire And maybe they couldn't do anything because they're. Frenchtown doesn't have a fire. And Frenchtown's gone digital, but we're working on trying to get something that can still be handed off to us. It's not our fault if something doesn't get handed off to us. But if it does get handed off, Catch it. Here's what I would tell you. If you have an incident where a fire report doesn't come to you, then put that in some narrative portion of it. So it's documented that you didn't have you didn't have any reporting from from that. I mean I mean I'm not trying to be yeah, advantageous towards them. I would just say if, if you're wondering if somebody comes back to talk about the fire report is not attached, you can put in your narrative in some side note saying did not receive a fire report. Now, if there's 60 reports tomorrow that say, but, but, you yeah, yeah. Report. <laughs> <laughs> if they gave they you know, a verbal fire report, that's, that's you know, you'd want to document that. Uh, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, Sorry. Any other questions? Oh. Sorry. Um, one more thing about a lab tech in regards to shifts when I talk about they are your responsibility. Look, Bob and I for sure, I know John is the same way. Oh, if it's family, you just yeah. go. Just go. We'll deal too. with it. If it's personal, just go. Yep. I mean, we, we'll cover it. We'll, yeah. we'll, if it's yeah, family, family, just go. If it's family, family. always first, just go. We'll we figure it out. It. If, it's, if it's not a family related thing and you're having a hard time getting the ship covered, but you're already signed up for it, it's still your ship, you know? But again, we'll and still so, help you. I mean, yeah, give you who's available. Yeah, we'll still try available. to help you, but it helps me to know that you also went out and did, did the footwork, you know? It, in the fire department, aero ambulance, messy ambulance, whatever, there was none of this lad tech. It was all, you know, working the phones and everything else to get ships covered and people to help you. And a lot of times that will go a long ways in addition to having to push that. And you don't have to come in here anymore to pull paperwork out like you used to. Because yeah. I've had, you know, people say the night before the ship, well, I can't work tomorrow. It's going to be alive. My ship. And oh, it's all everybody's fault for not covering it. When in reality, it's their fault because they never tried to talk to anybody about it except us at the last minute. And then it's like, wait a minute. We'll do our best, but Jeff, are you done? I don't think so unless there's any more questions. Okay. I will put a bunch of stuff in the storage piece on a lot of text you can read and I'll just, just put a little note and you know it's there. Okay. You guys just want to power through this so we can get the heck out of here? Yes. yes. Okay, so I'm I'm just gonna go through uh, some real quick little things I had written down, then we'll go over the radio things and I'll kind of back up some of the things that Don said, and then Robert's also gonna show us some stuff on the MDT. So working with other agencies, it seems like you guys have been doing a very good job out there uh, getting along with everybody. In this business, that's not always, even on your best behavior and taking the high road and everything else, things can happen. So I will say that when something comes to me or to Don or to Jeff about an incident with a messy crew, I immediately get into like defensive mode for the crew. It's not like 
It's not like, oh my God, they did that? Are you kidding? I, right away, I started thinking, all right, look at the past history here. What's the truth about this? You know, try to, and then do the background, do the research to find out what really happened, probably before I even come and talk to the crew. Um, and a lot of times find out, I, I bet 99% of the time, you guys know, it's always a little, something was missed here, something was missed there, something was said that somebody took one way, but it was not meant that way. And so, but you guys have been doing a really good job out there with that, so we appreciate the heck out of it. Um, but it is important that we always take the high road. Try to always take the high road. I tell myself that with the neighbor. Um, uh, some of the challenges of the outlying volunteer fire departments. I know it's frustrating sometimes when we're when we're busy and maybe we've been working in town where we've got you know people that we work with all the time that are on shift, they're paid, you know they're they're part of their team here in town. But in those outlying areas, that that gets so difficult to to staff those fire departments and. To, you know, yesterday we, we went up to Condon. I heard um, Iron heading up to Condon, and it really amazes me when you think about it. Condon's a small town. They they live in the in the woods. Most of them they live up in the hills. They live ten miles from the fire station or whatever. But something happens, and all of a sudden these people start coming up on the on the radio. You know, they're they're twenty four seven. So just remember, they have a they have a they do the best they can. And so when we work with them, we should always be uh, commending them, um, encouraging them, because we, the, you know, in, in Montana, we don't need to be losing those people. If we start to lose more volunteers, I don't know what the answer is gonna be to, to some of these areas, you know? And I understand like in Ravalli, Jeff and I have talked about this so many times, and we are working on things. I know it's hard for us when we get dispatched to the far side of Three Mile. So for for any medic and an EMT that cares about you know their patients, which we all do, that's why we do what we do. You're going to be concerned about the possibility that somebody is out there with chest pain, crushing chest pain, let's just say, and you know the status out there that maybe the responders. Your past history is the last couple of weeks there hasn't been many responders or something like that. For you, I know how hard that is to be sitting there thinking, is somebody doing something? And I think it is good for us to be thinking that and trying to work out something to figure out so they can get somebody there. It's not our it's not our fault when that happens. That's the fire agency's responsibility to get that handled. But it is important that we do the best we can to try to intervene or assist if there's any way we can. But it's just a hard situation to be in, you know. But some of those people won't have any volunteers, so nobody's going. I don't like the fact that we're going to be first on scene. I get the phone call, this is just wrong. And I'm like, I know it's wrong, but we've been dispatched. So at least just go, keep going. And I'll try to work some out in the meantime. But it's not my fire department. I, I work for a private ambulance service, you know, it's so there's some deep rooted issues out there. And when those happen, we try to do what we can as a private agency. If we were a government agency, there might be a lot more we could do to try to fix the problem, but we are not. So um, like we've always said, just go do the best you can, you know, to, to, to not feel guilt for you know what you know is going on there nobody's going to be at that patient for for a, quite a while it can be very difficult but again that's not it's it, it's good for us to be trying to fix the problem and it's good for the crews to be concerned about it and trying to you know uh maybe mention should we be getting life flight that kind of stuff i completely back the crews on that but in the end, it's those fire agencies, they've got to come up with a plan, you know? And so anyways, I don't wanna dwell on that. So just, you know, be good to the volunteers out there. Uh, you guys have been doing a good job. Challenges of some of the chiefs that I've been talking to and the um, incident command people that are out on those scenes. They've got a lot on their plate. 
and they're and they're not challenges with us. They just uh, sometimes it's difficult when they're when they're on an incident and they've got an ambulance coming or they've got resources coming. It doesn't matter if it's an ambulance, law enforcement, wildland fire, other engines coming. <clears throat> There's just a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff on their plate, and they're looking at the big picture. So, so a lot of times, what we're getting is a is just a minute part of the picture. They might be listening in the ambulance. We're trying to figure out why the hell would they do that, and you might want to get on the radio and question them about why they're doing that. But they're doing it because they're getting more information than we're probably getting, and at that time, they don't have time. <coughs> be explaining it over the radio. So if they give us orders, you know, divert us or whatever they do, just try to follow the orders. And that's what everybody's been doing. That's why we haven't had complaints. And, um, but just be aware, they've got a lot going on too, you know. Um, uh, we just had a meeting with uh, BCs, MFDBCs. That was a very good meeting. Um, Med 10, was a concept when it first started. I don't think we could stop that program now if we wanted to, because, and sometimes I want to. Um, but they have, I wouldn't say embraced it, but. Um, <laughs> well, now they have. actually, they have, because in cardiac arrest in this town, they want us there every single time. Well, it's, yeah, in, in the beginning, I had to go through a lot of stuff that. Mm -hmm may have not seemed like a love, but since all that's behind us now, um, it's integrated into the system. And so it's a very important piece of the response program that we have here. And so I was telling John and Jeff that um, it's gonna become more difficult for us to break out of the Med 10 thing. But the, the problem is like, like they're, you know, they've, they've, they've already, they're starting to assign us roles, like active shooter, you know, you guys are transport officer. And, you know, but if Ben's out in, uh, out in Ravalli and he has a, a bariatric patient, that's a priority to us. Our crews are our priority, but we're always gonna be trying to figure out how we can do this and then also get back and be near that vehicle where, where we have our stuff for doing the transport officer and everything else, whatever. I mean, you know, they're all just concepts. Is it ever going to happen? You never know. But um, <coughs> and I and, and going down to the valley, then you also lose that communication loop with them. You know, like being able to tell the, the VCs that we're struggling. But again, that's what's important is that we're there for you guys also. And so don't ever hesitate to call us. Ben calls, and that's good. Like, like that was a good. That was very smart that day to do that. Oh, now if. If the Medic 5 crew had not been busy, I probably would have sent one of the uh, Medic 5 crew down there with that rig, and then I would have partnered. I could have partnered up and made another ALS rig. We're always trying to, you guys know that, it's just like when we split up the partners, we're trying to always make ALS ambulances. So um, call us if you need help out there, all right? Don't ever hesitate. If you need lifting help, if you need some ideas, whatever you need, that's for there for you guys. Even though we're also getting kind of <laughs> mixed into this other role, but it, it's good. It's all good. It's what, what I was hoping that program would be when it all started. Um, oh, the uh, call in, the all call. I don't know who, who keeps hitting that, you know, the, when they're sending the pages out to the, uh, the front lines and the uh, on call. Why don't we take it off? Because it's important. Well, we did, and then somebody put back on. It's yeah, yeah, and it's but it is very important. We do need, and I think every crew member needs to have that ability because we never know what's going to happen or when that particular crew might have to make that decision. But but should an on call go through a manager anyway? Uh, yeah, but it, it might not though. I mean, it could it, it could be a situation it, that would be micromanaging even the SNAP program. We don't want to do that. So, so try to minimize that. But if you guys are at home some night and you get a something that comes through SNAP on your phone that says, <laughs> you know, large incident, crew members needed ASAP. 
If you're available, we would sure love you to come in. I'll put it that way. <clears throat> what I don't want to do is the boy that cried wolf where we start, um, where that thing goes off and pretty soon people block it on their phone or whatever. But um, at some point, we may end up having to use that and get everybody in. So um, how many people would come in if we had a big incident? Raise your hand. If, if you were available, good. That's good. Awesome. Um, I think one of the things is you got to put a blue bag in your own back pocket. Yeah. That's a pretty wide bird. That's just a piece of my own. So crampy, I'm ready. <laughs> We're trying to put that dispatch uh, station together here. We're still waiting for uh, Motorola to come over and run the antenna because we can't. But we want to put a dispatch station under where the uh, mailboxes are now. And it's not so that we can bug the hell out of everybody all day long, but it's so that we can communicate with each other at the station. There's a lot of times I know I need to get a hold of somebody and I'm not sure which ambulance just took this because they forgot to go in route or, or I wasn't listening or whatever the case may be. Flight team's coming in in 10 minutes, don't have time to get Medic 5 in for, for that. I'm still going to snap them in to, to make another ambulance, but we need to be able to communicate with each other that way. So and it would really come in handy for like if there was a big incident. And so I hope when that day comes, we have that desk set up in the next month or two that we uh, train a couple people to, if they get called in, to staff that desk and help make sure more people are coming in, make sure that they assign a runner to start getting ambulances out of the garage and ready to go. Um, that if one of us missed, missed something, that we're on our way in also, because the plan would be that um, we would start diverting our frontline ambulances to the bigger incident, depending on some of the mutual aid ambulances to cover the city more or less, you know, our call volume. But we would also need a manager here to, to kind of organize that stuff. So we have a plan. I just think it'll help with that, with that desk and it'll just help the more people that show up and the more people that are willing to assist if something like that ever happens. Because there's, there's always that notion when, when we do that training that like we're going to be the weak link or something and it just, it gets me. I, I, I feel like, I feel like we're not the weak link. We're, we're going so to we're be there. I don't care if we show up. Well, and they talk about, you know, we'll just, we'll just put them in the back of pickup trucks and, you know, there is that part of, of that particular, not, not a mass casualty, but a PAAIR that says ambulances or vehicles of opportunity. I hope if the day ever comes, we don't let them use, we find a way to be there so that they don't have to use those vehicles of opportunity. But that's a whole other class we've already got. Uh, <laughs> you know, the drunk redneck's going to take you to the hospital, you're crazy. <laughs> It's <laughs> kind of scary. Sir, I need to stay available. Can you please take it in your truck? Okay. So, okay, so we're trying to negotiate things with different fire departments as far as radios, and um, for the most part, I think our system works very well with the fire command channels. And um, what's really helped is us having the TAC channel and you guys using it very a lot, and, and us using it to talk to you. I think that's been good. I hear you guys when you're trying to determine the closest ambulance. That was one that I would just get raked over the coals. Like, we have to listen to your crew again, you know, trying to, which I'm not saying that was wrong that you were doing it on a fire channel, but I think now that we've got a, a repeated tack channel, that's the place to bring that traffic. You know, if you're trying to figure out which ambulance is closer, who's going to go. You guys are doing a great job at that. So that's been helping a lot. Um, the, the goal seems to be to try to minimize traffic on the fire channels, particularly fire two. So this has been ongoing for a while and we have been trying to come up with ideas. We fought it 
Um, we brought 911 in on it. Um, but we're also a contractor that wants to work for you know these fire agencies. We want to do the right thing. So we're trying to come up with some options to, to help the local fire department, the Missoula Fire Department, uh, take some of that traffic off of fire too. So some of the things that we're doing to do that, um, we're trying to find out if we can use fire three, not to go on route or anything like that. But you know, a lot of times we, we get on the radio to ask like if there's any calls pending, that kind of stuff. We could be doing that on a different fire channel, I think. Um, so my uh, plan is to look at fire three, but I gotta talk to Justin, I gotta talk to uh, Tucker up in uh, Condon, and 911's got to give us the okay. The only reason we do fire two is because we're, you know, we're sitting at St. Pat's, we're in the city, that makes sense that we would use that, but really there's no reason we have to. Another thing I might encourage is that when you're wondering if there's call volume, and you know Med 10's out there, maybe just get a hold of Med 10 on TAC and they should know if there's calls pending. But that's just a, that's just a suggestion, you still can, you still got to do it. You still got to find out. So whatever it takes to find out. I think the NBC is too. People sometimes jump to the radio for checking on the yeah. computer. Yeah. Well, I think part of that is Messi's fault. Maybe for over the last five years <coughs> having the computers, you couldn't really always trust, and so you just kind of got to the point where if you were inside of a garage, like at St. Pat's, you figured they probably, you know, the radio was or the MBT wasn't working, and so. Your only option then was to get on the radio, but um, I think we're slowly working the bugs out of the computers. Well, I haven't heard a lot lately. There's three or four people that always have issues with me, which makes me wonder because <laughs> there's also another great group of people that never have issues. So I don't know if it's just bad luck or whatever, but um, anyways, we all know there's been issues. So some of the fixes have been the MDTs, the new MDTs, and then also that cradle point uh, is going to make a big difference, um, and that's the uh, not the server, but the router. The router, yeah, that we've got in the ambulance. So those are new, and they're like Cadillacs compared to bicycles. No, not. these are good ones. Um, so, so anyway, what, what ISQ means? Do we have a special one? No, we use Spectrum. The secure, and it's through uh, Verizon. Okay. So anyways, uh, a lot of that stuff's getting fixed, so your MPT should work, and hopefully we will be using them more. That's what Robert's gonna help me with here in a minute. <coughs> um, I know a lot of you guys know how to do the MPT push button, right? Everybody knows how to use that, or? I found a lot of people don't know about the right-hand side where you can yeah. go around to the hospital. Yes. Stage. And where you can say where what hospital maybe. Right, yeah. that's like, that's my thing, so. <laughs> Well, well, pretty much a lot of people don't know that even exists. So, okay, so the thing is, we're going to start um, planning and preparing to use that. There are some times we can't use it. We can't use it when we go on route because we're an agency that get, gets dispatched as an agency. Right. So, but we, we think that will obviously take some of that traffic off. 911, when they talk to us about it, they love hearing uh, messy ambulances. They really do care about us. <laughs> I find that interesting when we talk to them. I think, you know, like, are they probably going to know who's calling or whatever. But no, they're very in tune to the, to the ambulances. And they feel like, you know, when people call for an ambulance, they want to know that we're there, we're safe, and we get that patient to the hospital. It means a lot to them. And I think that's cool that they keep an eye on us. And so whether it's push button or radio, they would prefer that we uh, don't ever stop talking on the radio, but we are trying to work with different agencies, so we'll do the best we can. So the MDT would, would be very good for everything other than going in route. So when you go in route, use the fire channel that you're gonna be operating on. And I would say most people do this, but make sure, because some of these days we get a lot of calls come in and um, always let 911 know what call you're going to. You know, like medic ones in route to 320 Whitford. It just helps differentiate calls, and then everybody else that's listening can can have a better feel for who's closer. Yeah. Uh, 
one of the things we used to do that no one does anymore is we used to say where we were from so the other crews all knew where you were at to give you them some information as though they might be closer yeah that's not bad i mean it's something to think about we always used to do yeah i guess right now let's try these other things i, I think the tac channel is fixing that i really do do you guys you guys feel comfortable using that channel and talking to each other on that that's been working all right you think it's been all right um so we have one problem with that thing it's repeated which is a great thing but a good example was us trying to talk to each other down River valley so i was able to talk to lovell the other day from um like the north side i could talk to him out in river valley uh, with our tag channel so i thought that was awesome but i was about two miles from ben and we were having a hard time talking now why was that i think part of that was because i was on my board new it was because we have a repeater so so now instead of us talking to each other it's going to the repeater oh, yeah. doing its little billionth of a second switch over and then going out on another frequency well that's why this repeater and direct is so important <clears throat> if i sat on the north side with my radio with with a, a repeater or not well with a repeater i could probably still have talked to level that day uh, with my portable because all i've got to do is hit that repeater um but for the most part i feel like we just need to know when to use a repeater and when not to and so where are the two repeaters that would help me. It, it's just at st pat's oh okay it's on st pat's up on the top okay so but but it, it's like <clears throat> if you're near somebody and you're driving down the interstate or something that's two vehicles think of direct as antenna to antenna and so if you're using that repeater and you're getting in a situation like that you're not going to be able to talk to each other even though you're like right next to each other like why aren't they answering this and before they did on mass attack because that was all direct but you would never be able to talk to each other the way we do now as far as like from the distances and so on so all that takes is a switch on your radio that allows you to go direct direct and repeater that's why we were showing that and so that's why on these portables you can do that you can you can go to direct and I should have done that that day. I should have grabbed my portable and just gone to direct. What's the range on the direct? Uh, on any, any kind of site to site antenna, more or less. Not, you know, like if there's something big in the way, a big mountain that's going to make a difference. So, I was at when you were coming down 93. We would have been able to chat. So, okay. if you were like low over it? No, then it would have been probably that would have been that no man's land between a repeater and a so it's probably, direct. It's probably 10 miles. <laughs> oh, man. The no man's land. Um, but anyways, the other thing is the mobile units do not have that direct, they don't have that direct capability right now. We're gonna get that fixed soon. But it's a programming thing, so Don's gonna have to go by with the computer and get them all programmed. Very important. Um, so Robert, why don't you come up and show everybody just a quick... Hey, you get that in PDT? Oh, that'd be great. Sorry, pump that. Five minute break? Uh, five minute break. Uh, like two. It's right there. There's one right there. Who's that? Who's that? You're losing us. <laughs> 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 Go now. Sure, leave it. Hello. I'm, I'm oh, sorry. I'm just nodding. Sorry, guys. You're right. Come back, Dave. That's it. Right. 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 So, I'm sorry. I, 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 I thought that was the same here. Turn the light. Robert, I have some problems with my radio. Okay, so operation of this radio. And I would just recommend that when you're working, when you're around your radio, start playing with it. If you have any issues, come to us. Come to me, I'll be happy to go through it with you. And not in a bad way, like, like let's get this figured out. It's, it takes a while in practice to get to the <laughs> So, but that one is switching by itself to A and B, if you watch it. I don't know if that switches to that. So whenever that happens on these radios, if you ever, if you ever have a problem with the channel or anything, or the bank that you're on on this one, 
this digital radio, if you go to the home button and hold it in, it's going to take you back to the main bank. So remember, whenever you're having issues and you need to get back to the main bank, hold the home button down. All right? It's Robert's phone. I don't know if an alarm is going off or if it's like someone's trying to call it. Yeah. Who's the guest? Say something serious. All right, you guys all know where to scan to turn it on and off is, right? Yes. Pretty simple. So if I want to have my scan on and I want to listen to all the stuff that's programmed in here, I keep my scan on. If I don't want to listen to all that, I take the scan off. When would be a time that you might take the scan off? On a call? Oh, okay. Can I just say how much traffic? Yeah. yeah. The manager's trying to call you. Yes. Yeah, like when you get really busy and things are out of control, sometimes you have to freeze the channel that you're working on. And you just have to turn your scan off on the, uh, you know, like, the only thing I don't like about that when that happens is that we can't get hold of you on a message tag, but it seems like the crews, once they get out of the ambulance, are very difficult to hold them. Now, I know most of the time it's because they're busy, they're in conversation, they don't want the radio turned up, so it's kind of a... These just don't have great reception in buildings, I've noticed. I mean, like... And that's pretty possible. bad. Yeah, that's because possible. I can hear fire calling me. I mean, it happens all the time, and I try to respond if they're yeah. up in the building or no. That can be a problem. And there's just I think the biggest problem, problem with that is that yeah. people go, oh, a radio, <laughs> and <laughs> start messing the antennas up. It's not a handle. It's yeah. not a handle. It's not a handle. <laughs> they can like glass. Bob, I did just try to go around on our phone room in the room today with this. And yeah. It was yeah. Was it in repeater mode or not? Um, it's, I thought it was in direct. Well, I think for 911, you I just, I just you pressed it. Yeah, so you just want to have your, uh, <laughs> your oh, it's the same. So right now you're on for your sensor off here. Okay. Hey, if you guys want to come up here and if Bob's done, Yep. So we can. Oh, oh, are you showing the buttons? Yeah. Well, I can't show the Oh, because uh, it's not a call. But I can educate. Someone's blowing up your phone. I'm trying to get a video. They don't keep care. I'm trying to get a video. I just like turn the volume on. It's what they're complaining about. It's not. I was not. It's 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 not. I don't think so those people back there care. <laughs> so <laughs> you can everything you, you can do everything but going route on the MDT here. Some agencies you can go on route, but they don't attach single units. If they attach single units, you could use that. But once so what Stacy was talking about, there's a whole another column of other buttons you can push. You just gotta come up here to available. Or whatever it says. Yeah, and click on it and it'll drop down a list. So if you were en route to a call right now, it should say uh, standby staged and there's a... En route to the hospital. Yeah, there's, well, that doesn't pop up until you go on scene. So it would come up here. So currently on here we have at the station, which we don't need to use because we're available. We're not at any stations status which we will use so you'll go if you're going to go to spokane or something you'll go here status you'll leave the first stat thing as status so everyone knows you're not available for calls and then you can enter your secondary location so if you're going to st pat's to spokane just write st pat's to spokane and then you'll hit send and then it will update to all the mdts the fire department can see that one of the als ambulances is out of town so when you come back from that you can hit once you go here we'll just do it here Barb's phone's gonna ring in about four minutes i don't care <laughs> there it is <laughs> uh, i don't have service never mind i can't do it so once you go status the yeah the router's not picking up once you get back you can just put yourself available you just hit available delete whatever you wrote as your uh, secondary location don't uh, forget to do that yeah, don't forget to do that. I mean, it, if you if you forget and you go on route to the next call, dispatch will automatically clear it and it'll put you to whatever call you're going to. 
On this side of the screen will be your in route button, or no, your, excuse me, your on scene button. So once you go on route, there'll be a button up here. You can just push once, it'll go on scene. Uh, then on this side, once you go on route, if you're gonna stage, you can just click the stage button. You don't have to talk at all. And then, oh, the other one I was thinking of is in route off scene. We don't need to use that. That's something the cops use. If they're gonna go from, <clears throat> say they were dispatched to one address, but they're gonna go check for someone at a different address, they'll update where they're physically at. So you don't need that. Um, what else? Hospital transports. Oh yeah, hospital. So you can, once you're ready to transport, you can just pick to hospital. And then where it says secondary location, just write CMC or SPH will be St. Pat's. Uh, when you clear yourself out of the hospital, you don't need to pick any atom codes. We're not, we don't need to use the atom codes. The cops only need that, so. You just, just hit the clear button. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, just hit the clear and yeah. hit okay. Yeah, and so, so. you don't need to pick atom codes. So, you, like, like, you've been using it quite frequently. Yeah, I use so it every you call. You've kind of been an experimenter. Yeah. And how, how are you finding, like, if you're driving, your partner's in the back, you get to the hot, when you're leaving the scene, does it work okay? Do you have time to do it? Oh yeah, you have plenty of time yeah. to. And then go you get to the there. hospital. You got plenty of oh, yeah. time. Yeah, because yeah, so it just it just you just hit the button and then it comes up with like a verification, you either cancel or okay, and just hit okay to it. All right. Can so I, I'm, I'm going to call nine one one tonight and tell them that we're they're going to see more of this. So so this is the official word to you guys that the, it, it's okay to use it. The only time the only place that I know you won't be able to do this is in Potom Potomac. Yeah. and maybe certain parts of Sealy. Once you hit like, I think it's like mile marker six on 200, yeah, your MDT will see. not update until yeah. you hit Potomac, then what's that? I'm 12 and bang up. Yeah, 12 yeah, obviously, but we don't really. Won't have any this will work all the way up in our Lee and past our Lee, so. Can we just put it down if we're going version or uh, codes one we, I just did call We haven't I discussed call that. I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, and I've never had a like that's what shows Honestly, up. that's exactly what shows up. So I just put the no hospital. No one, no one cares. Is the problem? Like you can get on and tell them you're on code three of the hospital, and they advise the city PD and the sheriff's office, and none of those officers care what yeah. you're going. Right, right, exactly. It's Until just, that's their protocol. <laughs> that's so. their protocol, but Until none of the cops care what you're doing. Totally they're they're out doing something else. Yeah, wait, wait, let me just back up. We yeah. do get calls, though, saying, hey, why is there an ambulance going code yeah. three that nobody yes. let us know about? Right. So. And that's only 911, though, asking you that. But, like, if you ask any of the cops, they don't care what you're doing. I want to know what you're doing. People yeah. care. Is that the consensus? Okay. Yes. You, know where that was you need to let them know. Mm -hmm. If you cross the county line code for you, you've got to let that yeah. county know. So that's why we put that Ravala County in that first name. So once you get the law, you should contact Ravala County and tell them you're coming in there. And they'll give you a short report to tell you what's going on with that patient. Because the only thing we get is we know we're going to for a 56 year old male with whatever and three miles been dispatched. If you get on that Valley County Fire 2, they'll give you a short radio report about what you're going to. And you need to let them know you're coming in their county code three. That's, we have to notify them. You'd still, have, for us. you'd still have to go and route through our 911. Yes, that's fine. You could still, you know, you'd have to go you can go on to Ravalli County and tell them. You can, you can talk, talk to Ravalli County. Yeah, right, exactly. But, but yeah. when you're done with the call, after you've told 911, you can still do all that stuff on there. Mm -hmm. from Ravalli, oh, yeah. This works all the way down to Ravalli County. 911 needs to know that stuff. I want them yeah. putting code three on there, okay? Code three or code one. Yeah, yeah. Because it's well, gonna help me and men can when I You only need, need to write it you only need to write C three if you're on code three. Is that, so is if that you're not you're transporting code, don't just write St. Pat's or CMC. Okay. Right. If you're going code, just write C three. Okay, so S P H comma C3. Dash C three, whatever. Yeah. If it's code one, just nothing, just nothing. Just nothing. Yeah. Just put the yeah. hospital name. Can I point out one other thing? Because yeah. it yes. can be frustrating. The, this can work, like everything can be working, but if this word is not highlighted and you see it Correct. and it's like right. a shadow, that for some Touch reason it's not functioning. Yeah. Oh, I know why. So, so like, we have, no, we have no service right now. 
Right, but sometimes so this is working, serious. but this right side, if it's not highlighted for some reason. On med pen, and, I have to to, and to fix that, yes, you're right. To fix that, you got to go up here and go to utilities. I think that's why I haven't used it. So, yeah, how do you get, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so you get if, that if you are not, if your available is not white, you need to register your MDT. Yeah. Go to utilities and click register and it'll do it. Sometimes I don't know that far, the bar only drops down once you hit this word. The register thing? Nope, oh, available. Yeah. Or whatever your so it is. I mean, it doesn't have to say available. It could be on scene. Yeah, it's weird. That's whatever that's your status is. Crap, but that's what will that's the word that handle. Drop yeah. it down. Is yeah. there an alarm button up there, too, though, that we shouldn't hit unless we need to? Yeah. Uh, are, yes. are our ambulances connected? I know yes. the sheriff's office yes. and the cops are connected. They are Jim, connected. Are, are we connected? Yeah. yeah. And you hit that so alarm try button. It. And they'll start calling you because we did it when they first put it out. Okay. And it is noticeable down there. They'll yeah. start ringing their uh, their computers freeze up. They can't. Okay. None of them. The That's not to say if not. something happened to you and you Where is hit that, that button that that might right. be part of the process of waking them up and waking the rest of us up to help. Well, we're not attached. Well, not attached. Not attached. But is it up in this like main? It's, it's like it's like it will be. It will be right up here when you're attached. Nobody, nobody believes it. Like it's like a red siren. Yeah, it's a red siren. Yeah, red siren. yeah. and it does work. It's, <laughs> I've hit it in the gut. You know what I mean? Not at all. Yeah. Nice. Like if you call, if you're in a jam and you call for law enforcement code three, I feel like they're kind of just like. Oh. Yeah, for sure. What do you need them? Versus code like code? if we had a distress code, like that would yeah. Kind of yeah. Trouble. Is yeah. it a verbal yeah, thing or a physical thing? Uh, but, okay, he's going to block my millimeter and he shot my partner. Is that a good yeah. for you? Yeah. Well, I'm dead now. <laughs> Where's the I'm dead you're like, now? You're like, you're like, Do you hear these gunshots? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> these are hot <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, you can ask for a lot of people.